Okay, so we are, I think we are live, Alistair. Good evening, uh, I'm Alistair Grant, uh, the chairman of the Anglo-Chilean Society. I would like to welcome all of you this evening and especially all our members um, who have joined us for our first virtual event of 2021. Um, for those of you who don't know so much about our organization, uh, we are a charity which exists to promote um, Chilean talent within the United Kingdom, educate the people of the UK about Chile, and to help those most in need in Chile. And so it's a great honor th this evening uh, for our first event. Um, we have Francisco Urbañez, uh, who is a Chilean who won a Chevening Scholarship to study uh, in the UK. And uh, that is a very rare uh, scholarship. And it's only very recently that Chileans um, have uh, been awarded the scholarship to study in the UK. And so we're very honored that, uh, to have him this evening um, to present his uh, documentary. Um, while I have uh, the attention of all of you before we start, can I just, uh, I guess in, in particular to our members, uh, tell you that we have a program of events uh, over this lockdown period. Um, we have an exclusive showing of the um, mole agent um, for our members, uh, which is an acclaimed uh, film that has just come out. Uh, we also have a uh, presentation by Dr. Axel Kaiser entitled Chile in the Years to Come Risks and Opportunities on the 25th of February, which uh, should be a very interesting talk uh, considering the uh, political climate at the moment uh, in Chile. Um, and then that culminates in uh, with the AGM on the 11th of March. Um, so hopefully we will keep you entertained uh, during this period. If anyone uh, is enjoying our virtual events and wants to make a donation, um, they can uh, do so via anglochileansociety.org and find out more about the Anglo Chilean Society. And uh, um, if you're enjoying, um, you know, hopefully you might want to make a donation uh, if you've enjoyed uh, the events that we've been putting on for you over the winter. Um, so there does seem to be some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Hopefully we can actually gather in person uh, later on in this year, maybe at the end of the summer or the early autumn. Um, but it has been uh, fantastic that the committee have put together uh, such a comprehensive uh, list of virtual events uh, to keep us going during this difficult time. So uh, back on to this evening and Francisco Abanez. Uh, he is an architect, urban planner and photographer who specializes in urban regeneration. In 2015, as I mentioned, he was awarded the Chevening Scholarship to uh, complete his studies, um, an MSc at uh, UCL. He has worked in Chile and the UK with leaders from private and public sectors in consultation processes, strategic definition, design and implementation of urban development and regeneration projects. In parallel, Francisco has carried out several photography research projects, documenting and critically reflecting on the transformation of cities. Francisco's photography work has been published worldwide and exhibited in group and solo exhibitions in Chile and the UK. Francisco has also organized and co-curated several group exhibitions and digital events. He is the co-founder of TIVA, a new architecture, urbanism and projection management practice based in Santiago, Chile. The practice places a special emphasis on community consultation, sustainability and understanding the full life cycle of buildings and cities. After the documentary, um, there will be a discussion uh, between Francisco Ibanez and Luke O'Donovan, who is an architecture photographer 
and creative producer based in London. His work has been widely published and exhibited, including as part of the London Festival of Architecture and the Royal Academy of Arts Summer Show, and shortlisted in the British Photography Awards, the Blueprint Architecture Photography Award. In 2020, Luke founded Zoomed In, a digital festival celebrating architecture and photography and the Architecture Photography Fund, a mentorship and grant scheme to support diversity within the industry. Luke is currently working on The Last Days of Coal, a long-term series documenting the last remaining coal power stations in Britain. And later this year, he will be presenting his first exhibition as a curator, Power Structures in collaboration with Francisco Abanez. So um, Francisco will now uh, share via Zoom the video um, so you don't actually have to uh, leave the Zoom at all. Um, however, if you are having issues with your bandwidth, uh, with all of us on it at once and trying to play this video, um, there is a YouTube link within the chat, which has just been put up by Francisco. So you can click on that at any time if you feel that you, you will get better quality uh, going to YouTube. And then you can come back to us and uh, Francisco and Luke uh, we'll uh, have a discussion and then there'll be time uh, for some questions and answers. Okay, I uh, hope you enjoy the short uh, documentary and uh, we'll be back shortly. Thank you. Cities can be seen as a performance, a spectacle of constant conflict, negotiation and flux. We have been building cities for centuries. By 2030, 60% of the world population will be living in urban areas. The built environment needs to change, responding to shifting necessities, plan and plan events, and to physical, functional and financial obsolescence. Cities are key contributors to pollution. Construction alone accounts for half of all global carbon emissions. The concept of creative destruction was first used in economics to define the destruction of technologies created by the emergence of new ones. In the built environment, to different extents, every act of creation entails an act of destruction from communities and intangible social links to places, buildings and their components. Every new project needs to reflect on pre-existence and its own death. Grouped under the title of Creative Destruction, the photographic series Non-Structures and Palincest document the transformation of London, one of the main real estate markets in the world. The photographic research focuses on buildings and neighborhoods that are undergoing a transformation process, interrogating the reasons behind their change. The ongoing series Non-Structures captures key moments in the life of diverse buildings, revealing a condition of transience, trapped as these buildings and sites are between the boundaries of architecture and ruin planning and chance, process and product. The term non-structures alludes to a boundary condition defined by an absence of identity which has lent its name to the series. Using similar parameters of light, composition and scale and removing any reference to actions, these non-structures appear to be frozen in a specific time and context, 
as dysfunctional devices that question collectively the impermanence of the city. From the demolition of iconic buildings to various transformations of anonymous ones, the photographs aim to unveil the unexpected and sculptural morphology of these non-structures, while simultaneously documenting the constant tension that exists with their surroundings. They become an abstraction of finalized buildings, reduced to their most basic elements, facade, core, structure, interior dividing walls. Can they be considered involuntary works of art? The series is divided in different typologies. Co-structures, deconstructed, naked, obsolete and unsustainable structures. While being transformed, buildings and neighborhoods reveal themselves as being vulnerable, fragile and temporary, all attributes that are intrinsic to cities, but from which architecture tends to run away from. Beyond visual documentation, this series of images initiates a dialogue concerned with what type of future we want for the places in which we live, work and pass the time. Which buildings or elements should be retained to preserve the memory of a place? Can preservation occur without regulation? When we design buildings, are we really thinking on how they will die? Can design give space to its own transformation and death? As a continuation of non-structures, the series Palincest documents several construction sites and contrasts them with their usually eclectic context. The photographs of the series reveal different visual layers of historic development, interrogating the architectural approach of each generation, their response to physical and financial obsolescence, and their common vision and understanding of how cities should evolve. The concept of palimpsest refers to a writing material used one or more times after earlier writing has been erased. Cities can be conceived as a palimpsest, illustrating the traces of time created by the chronological superposition of urban layers. The city becomes a manuscript, which is constantly being modified in a non-linear and often chaotic way, or a patchwork quilt with contrasting colors, patterns, sizes and materials. The photographs play with the idea of the city as a collage, exploring the concepts of contrast, friction and noise. At its best, urban regeneration and renovation address the obsolescence of the built environment by coupling a desire to preserve history with innovative solutions that tackle community necessities, avoid gentrification and preserve natural environments. At its worst, the old city is wiped out, creating sanitized neighborhoods without any memory or identity. The series aims to explore both ends. What is the right balance between development and preservation? How are old and new architecture styles speaking to each other? How can we make cities and buildings more flexible and better prepared to face crisis and change? Buildings birth, life and death, they are part of the same cycle. I hope that everybody could see the, 
the video well. I think the sound worked well and the image worked pretty well as well. Great, um, well sorry. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Yeah, so um, welcome everyone to our uh, little chat. Thanks very much for joining us on a, on a Wednesday evening. Um, so yeah, after film kind of um, myself and Francisco, we're gonna have a little bit of a talk about Francisco's work and some of the themes and some of the techniques behind it. Um, but do please feel free to add your own comments, add your own questions, you know, keep them coming, whether you're on Zoom or YouTube, and we'll be keeping an eye on those, feeding them into the conversation and then visiting some of them again at the end. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the video and um, congratulations Francisco as well. I know it's taken a lot of hard work to get it to this point. And um, thanks as well to Alistair for the introduction and the Anglo-Chilean Society for hosting us. So to understand a little bit more about the project, Francisco, I'd like to go back, I think it's just over five years now, isn't it, that you, um, you know, you'd come from Chile and you were moving to London, you know, one of the most exciting cities in the world, you know, to, to make a new life for yourself and, um, you know, continuing your career in architecture. But you found amongst all those kind of busy and exciting times, you carved up the time to be photographing construction sites and all these buildings that were falling apart in London. So could you maybe just transport us back to that time a little bit and tell us about what drew you to starting off this project? Uh, yes, of course. Hi, hi everyone. It's a, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be here with you today. Um, and so five years ago, as, as Luke and Alazar said, uh, I came to UK to study a master's. I, uh, it, it was always, I always considered this time to be for a specific time of, for a specific period of time. Um, we are going back pretty soon with Male, my partner, to Chile. Um, and the whole idea of starting to photograph these construction sites um, were to get into know the city and somehow relate my photography work with what I was studying at the moment, which is urban regeneration. Uh, so to start learning from the city itself, uh, urbanism, architecture and, and other um, professions related to the development and regeneration of the real environment, they are not exact sciences. Uh, and you should, by observing the city and by analyzing the city and understanding what's happening, that this definitely has a, a value. Um, and for me, starting to document these various projects allowed, allowed me to get to know the city, getting to know the culture behind the transformation of the city. Um, a lot of the professionals involved and getting to know some of the local communities as well. And this image that is on screen right now, it was the first image of the series No Structures, uh, which I found this building a couple of months after arriving to London. Um, and when I saw it, I was absolutely fascinated by it. And I knew that there was an opportunity there for, for initiating a, a series uh, or a photographic research with my personal work. Um, at the time, I didn't have an objective of the series. I didn't know how long it was, it was going to be or what was going to be the extent of it or the scope. Um, but today, looking back, uh, I see that that image as a, as a, or that moment where I found that building as a very important moment. And after finding that, I started to look for, for different ways of unsustainable buildings or unsustainable structures. So that's how I found this building here in, in Borden Street, Unsustainable Structures 7. And then after looking for unsustainable buildings, I found a sustainable um, ghost structures and uh, naked structures and all the different typologies that I'm, uh, I have incorporated into the series. Um, so they are all in a way ephemeral constructions, construction sites that as the documentary, the mini documentary mentions, um, those construction sites have temporarily lost their function. They're in between being architecture and ruin. They have having a function and being completely dysfunctional. Um, and during that period of time, they tend to be overlooked and people don't necessarily appreciate the beauty, the real beauty that they have. And what, was there a moment that within this project, it kind of clicked that you were onto something, you know, there was a pattern of this throughout the city. It wasn't just one off sites. It, it was one of the things that, that actually impressed me a lot when I, when I first arrived to, to London. So coming from a sizable city like Santiago, um, it didn't impress me the, the, the 
the, the, the speed of the, of the city and the intensity, but rather the, the sheer number of construction sites there, there were in, in the city. And that's why close from where I live in, in East London, and there are a lot of construction sites, but then going to other parts of the city, I started to find some other ones, uh, which was very interesting and it's exciting at the same time to get my bike cycle around and find these, these different construction sites. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so what, one of the, um, the other images we have up on screen is um, this by Denise Scott Brown, which is kind of an um, example you highlighted to me of a, you know, um, a photographer that you've been inspired by looking beyond, I guess, um, you know, for you coming to London as an outsider, I'm sure, you know, you must have at some point had the visits to, you know, Big Ben, Trafalgar Square and all of that, but you were drawn to these much more everyday scenes, weren't you? It's more uh, mundane scenes, exactly. And um, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, they, they wrote that book, which was very influential for, for, influential for architecture. Um, but in that couple, uh, Denise Scott Brown is usually overlooked and she took all the photos of the book and the photos were massively influential. Uh, and since university, I have looked and, and wondered um, and really liked her work, her photography work. I've been able to, to visit exhibitions where these photos are on display and they're very, very interesting. And in a nutshell, what they did is the, the book that, the, that Robert Venturi and her, uh, both, they both wrote, it's called Learning from Las Vegas. And they essentially started to look at cities and learning from cities and look at um, the symbolism of all of these constructions that were made many times without architects in, in Las Vegas and starting to question architecture made by architects uh, from this, this uh, research work, from this photographic and also um, kind of research that went beyond the image as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's definitely worth for those of you that aren't aware, having having a look at after this. Um, but yeah, something that really kind of interests me about your images is, um, you know, in many senses, they are quite simple. You know, there's very kind of strong, um, basic geometric forms in a lot of them, kind of straight on, straightforward compositions. But at the same time, you know, um, with all the stuff that you mentioned in the video and all these references we bring up, there's some much bigger concepts at hand about um, you know, the way that we live in cities, the way that we build cities and the way they regenerate over time. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, um, how do you approach kind of these very abstract concepts, bringing them into a visual form? Um, so those abstract concepts, they would usually be, um, you could link these images to a lot of different, um, challenges and problematics that the city is facing in itself. And for example, many, you don't have to show bullets to talk about war. You don't need to show um, architecture, formal architecture to talk about urban development. You don't necessarily need to show finalized buildings to talk about the issues that the finalized city has or the, work, the working city has. So in many ways, for example, this particular image um, is a retained facade in Eldgate. Uh, the facade itself is covered. Um, and while the building is trans transformed, you have this form, which is very clean and aesthetically, it looks quite well. Um, but then without showing that retained facade, you can, you can set a lot of, or pose a lot of questions about uh, what, back, what can be considered heritage, uh, what should be con uh, which buildings should we protect um, and how should we approach the, the transformation of the city? The death of buildings, are we planning enough for the death of these structures that we are designing right now? So you're absolutely right that a lot of um, concepts, and I like the fact that you're uh, raising that, a lot of concepts can be taken from these images. Uh, and that's the whole idea of the, of the project in a way, to. to to spark a lot of questions and to spark a lot of debate about how these buildings and cities are, are being transformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I really like that analogy of saying um, to represent war, you don't need to take photos of bullets. And I'd like to bring that to a piece of um, photo I took, um, kind of looking at demolition of an industrial building. This is Kingsnall Power Station 
in North Kent. And, um, you know, this is kind of maybe a more sort of um, blunt approach to it, where I was looking at a very instantaneous moment of the demolition. Um, but within your work, I guess, you are more trying to tell the story of the process. So how do you kind of pick and choose those moments that tell, you know, the story of a wider period of time rather than just that one instant? That's, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. And going back to the image that you were showing before, some demolitions would, or some transformations would be instantaneous, such as the, the explosion or, or exploding a building and demolishing like that. But some other transformation will, transformations would take a longer period of time. Um, and as part of my work, I visit those transformations for that period of time, which in some, in some cases it has been weeks, in some other cases months, and some other cases even years. So for example, Robin Hood Gardens in Poplar, I, I use that project as, a, as my case study, my final thesis in my, in my master's. Uh, and I have been following the project ever since. Um, and then I obviously have tons of photos, but I would choose one or two images that actually reflect on the particular set of challenges and the particular set of, of uh, bigger questions that need to be asked about that particular project. Mm -hmm. And so I guess over, over, over several years, you started to to grow this collection of images and then within that you start to discover the ways that they they interact with each other and become did you feel that um you know they became something else as they became a collection rather than just a couple of images here and there they, they have definitely become a, a collection of, of images and somehow i started to to create a parallel city in a way of these ephemeral constructions uh, and in a way we're going to see afterwards a photo of an exhibition. If you place them side by side, it beca they become a portrait of London during this period of time where I have been living here. So I wonder if, if uh, by looking at the images on this period, you can actually tell some of the things that they were happening, such as Brexit, such as a uh, global pandemic, um, the Black Lives Movement, the, all the Extinction Rebellion and all the movements around global warming, those have been really, really important events for the UK and the world. And I wonder if you can see some of those um, or at least read some of those events in the images that I have been creating on the collection of images. Uh, this, we, we included this uh, image of Bernard and Hilia Becher. They are a couple of German photographers who you know very well, Luke, as well. Uh, yeah. And they, they have influenced my work and, and have they influenced your work as well? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And but what I, what I um, find interesting is that you're talking about your work in a very kind of timely way as, you know, as reflecting on the issues of here and now, but you're using a very um, kind of timeless style and you're, you know, influenced by this, um, you know, the Dusseldorf movement, which is all about kind of, um, I guess, simplicity of form yeah. Um, so how do you kind of um, find that you balance that kind of respect for your kind of more classical influences or even I mean we I think maybe classical is the wrong word to use because we're talking about you know maybe 50 years ago but in the scheme of art that's nothing it's just because of the way photography is such a young form of art um, but how do you kind of balance those traditions with trying to have a contemporary aesthetic to your work? It's a, it's a really good question. I think if you go back to the image of, of, the, of the, or the collage of the Bechers, uh, they started working with the idea of typology. And my work obviously has a lot of relation to that. Um, and I think that it's important to have references, but at the same time to add something new to your work and add a little bit of, of a new twist to those references that you're looking at. And in my case, for example, I do work in the series non-structures. I do work with that frontal approach, the idea of collecting different typologies, that idea of having a, a very neutral approach to light, uh, removing any reference to time, therefore. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm documenting the a transformation. So time becomes an essence in the image as well. Um, and probably in the images of the Bechers, they, those, those particular constructions, they were going to uh, disappear in a certain moment, but they were not 
considered to be ephemeral constructions or constructions that were undergoing a transformation process. Um, Thomas Truth, the, the image before, he's, he, he's from the, the same school of, as the Bechers, uh, a movement that was called the, the Dusseldorf uh, School of Photography. Um, and he has a pretty similar approach to the Bechers by giving it a twist, his own twist, uh, observing the Dvanal, the day-to-day uh, build um, cities and the transformation of the build environment and documenting things that at, at a first glance they might not be attractive, visually attractive, uh, but when you photograph them in a certain way and observe them in a certain way you would, you would find beauty where probably other people don't necessarily see it. Um, and then going to the, so that uh, that Dusseldorf School of Photography also influenced other photographers in America, uh, in the US, uh, where a new uh, movement called New Topographics started as well, documenting the day-to-day -day life on the banal objects. Um, and in other parts of the world, some other photographers started to explore that. And a more contemporary photographer that I like a lot is Nadav Kander. And he part his, his approach to photography, you many times would not know if, if what he's documented, if it's real or not, if they are digitally modified images or if they are actual reality. I, I tend to uh, relate his work with uh, Philippe Dujardin, uh, another photographer, but that he modifies, he does modify the images digitally, but they seem to, to look like reality. So you wonder, is this real or not? And Nadav Kander, in a, in a way, he does the same, but coming from reality. Dujardin comes from, from, from something that he has modified. The approach, the color, the aesthetics of Kander, I do like them as a lot. And this um, image here of Karam al Masri, uh, it's a stunning image, absolutely beautiful. And uh, um, it is an image that shows war without bullets, that shows architecture, urban development without necessarily having to show the finalized new building, shiny building. And it's a photo that, that only a person that, can, um, that lives in the city and knows the city pretty well can, can actually observe that moment and, and view that moment. I'm taking them, I'm paraphrasing by the way, uh, an article by, um, an article look by the photographer that you sent me, Edmund Summer. Oh yeah. I'm paraphrasing Edmund Summer in, this, in, the, in the way that he, he says that he, this is his favorite architectural photograph, uh, photo of all time. And I, I agree with him 100%. It's such a sensitive and such a beautiful image that captures the essence of what's, of what's happening there and sparks a lot of questions about what's happening in that moment, it describes a lot of things and bring, brings a lot of, of attention and discussion to, to it. So. Yeah, it goes beyond the image in a way. What, what do you think about? I, I, I mean, I think this is a um, it's an incredible piece of photography. The way um, I think what's special about this is this is an image that maybe wouldn't have been possible 50 years ago. It's the way that it kind of it um, in terms of the way it's composed with you know the geometry of it and everything. It's um, you know takes from that Dusseldorf style, but it's kind of combining it with the best of. Um, you know, modern press photography and, you know, what digital cameras they enable you to do moving quickly. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it kind of use, uses that same simplicity of geometry too, but um, it kind of really focuses on, in on the image and uh, I guess allows you to have that focus on the more emotive elements, which is what it's trying to put across. And I think it's incredibly, it's incredibly powerful. It is. Um, yeah. And again, I kind of, I know this is, you know, at the surface level, this feels very different from your kind of work. And I guess there's more of the humanistic element to it, but then it's the same, it's a similar kind of compositional style. It's that same idea of, um, you know, with an Adav Kanda image, it's kind of suspending reality and looking at these, um, you know, almost in a sculptural way, looking at kind of the interventions in cities and um, turning that into something beautiful. Um, so go, go, going back to your project, so, you got to a point where you'd been working on it for two, three years. You'd really started be becoming rather than just a couple of photos here and there, a real body of work. So the next stage, um, and actually where we met was in 2019, you exhibited it for the London Festival of Architecture. 
I know you'd also exhibited it in Chile as well before we met. So do you want to talk a little bit about how it came together, you know, when you knew it was the right time to exhibit this? Um, it's a good question. As I, I did work for a long time in the images and, and it took me a long time to actually un understand the whole narrative, the whole concept and what, what I was doing with the images. And I do enjoy a lot the fact that to, I, I enjoy a lot that slower approach to a series. And I, I think that that's something that, that that's something that you can do for your personal work. And um, it was only when I understood well what the images were forming, the, the narrative that they were forming, and also that they, they as, a, as a body of work, they started to look um, more complete and they could narrate a story, um, an idea that, wanted, that I wanted to communicate that that's when I decided. I don't think there's a particular moment where I'd said, okay, this is it. Um, it was more a period of time where I started to feel more comfortable about exhibiting the series and also about publishing the series as well. But they are both open and uh, open series. So non-structures and palimpsest, I don't think I'm ever going to finish those series because um, I, I, would, I, would love, I would love to be 80 years old, keep documenting the way London is, trans, uh, is transforming, keep documenting between now and then how the city has, been, has evolved and also work with other cities as well, such as Santiago uh, and maybe some other cities as Tokyo. I would love to start documenting what's happening in Tokyo and maybe cross or starting to compare those images as you can compare them, the different typologies that you have because of the lighting conditions that I have used and the, the, the kind of approach to um, a composition, a similar composition approach, you can start combining them different cities or different periods of time. So you can compare Algate in, or a part of London in 2020 and in 30 years from now um, and, and extract some pretty interesting conclusions and, and start a debate as well on how that city, area of the city has evolved. So yeah, it's, I don't think there was a particular moment where I say it was more like a period of time. Yeah, and I guess there's that, I think it's um, Picasso, isn't it? That famous quote of, you know, art is never finished, only abandoned. And that's very much, I mean, it feels like, yeah, this is something that because you're, it's, um, you know, very in the moment and recording a particular moment in time, it can continue and can keep on going indefinitely. Um, so I remember when, when we, um, when we met first met and at your exhibition and we were talking about the work one of the words that came up was um facadism and within this non-structure series which is the first part of your work you know which is you exhibited this independently of a um palimpsest series um it's kind of yeah it really brought up this theme about how um facades of buildings relate to you know how we how we use them um and you know if you look at london um I think the facade, I mean facades to, in a non-architectural sense, we normally, I guess, use to mean hiding something or pretending or faking. Mm -hmm. um, but in London, I feel kind of facade is often the opposite. It's something that can tell you something about a building. You know, if you look at um, the way that um, buildings, older buildings are engraved or they have kind of, yeah, they are made of them or they have kind of some sort of illustrative element, say what happens inside them, going through to a modern day with high tech buildings where, you know, a facade is all about the structure and how a building's made. Um, and how the building works, which I think is really interesting. Um, but maybe is that something that you think will continue, or do you think this is what you've seen for your series is the way that actually a facade isn't representative of what happens in a building? And is that kind of a trend you think will happen more in London? And what will that mean for the city? I mean, the the, the facadism is something that you can observe in different different cities around the world. Um, and essentially means that you are retaining the front part of the building, what's visible, and then uh, demolishing all the rest and, and rebuilding all the rest. And I think that you know, in a particular set of cases, it, it's something that it would make sense to do. But when you see it as a widespread practice, when you see it everywhere in a city, then it, it means that it's in a way the automatic approach. And one of the questions that, uh, that I mentioned in the, in the mini documentary is that you, can you have preservation without regulation? Uh, demolishing something, a building means that there's a, that building will have a lot of embodied carbon 
uh, it will be part of the memory of a place, um, of the character of, of, of a specific place, um, and demolishing it and leaving a facade only, it, it can be seen as, an, as a little bit of an act of um, not, not necessarily wanting to have or, or creating that uh, preservation and conservation. Um, it is something that will continue to happen, but I don't think it's a practice that should we should uh, consider as as completely adequate because it's uh, um, it is something that it's not bottom line. It's not saving the the character of an area. It's not doing enough for for heritage and. and mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it's something that's very relevant at the moment, particularly as we talk about the way. Um, you know, the pandemic is changing how we work. And that means that um, there's a lot of buildings in the city that are changing the way that they're used. So maybe offices are gonna be used for other purposes in the future. You know, a lot of retail um, tenants are moving out. Um, you know, this happens anytime there's a kind of um, major shock to the economy and buildings, you know, they're changing the way that they're used. And also it's very, um, again, relevant at the moment because of um, one of the big sort of controversies the architecture world right now is the idea of permitted development, which is a law that allows, um, you know, contractors to provide emergency housing for people in buildings um, such as offices or warehouses that are converted and they don't necessarily have to meet um, regular housing standards. So do you think that kind of, um, you know, will be more of a concern in the future of buildings that you know, are made for one thing and been used for another thing, or is it? Could it actually be done in a better way where it's a positive opportunity? Um, I think that part, part of the challenges that we will have as a that we have right now in the in the transformation of the built environment is to is to make buildings and to make the built environment in general flexible, because we are going to be facing several changes in the in the decades to come because of global warming and because of a changing changing world, really changing technologies as well. Um, so we, we need to plan for, for flexible cities and flexible buildings and flexible constructions. Um, that being said, there are buildings that have been designed and that are not necessarily flexible, such as office space that is currently being converted to housing, as you were saying, uh, that is not always made in the, in the best way and the results are not always the best. So I think there is a there is a it's a double-edged sword in a way. We need to plan for the build environment to be flexible. A lot of projects are flexible, but then a lot of projects are not, or buildings are not flexible. And we need to we need to understand that and uh, study in a way case a case by case scenario mm -hmm. and understand what's the best solution that we can find for that particular place. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, your, your non-structure series definitely looked at these sort of issues in a individual case-by-case -case basis, looking at buildings, um, you know, in isolation. But of course, you know, there's um, the issue of, you know, buildings don't work in isolation, they work in a city. And um, Palimpsest, is, I think, is fantastic the way that it complements the non-structure city because it starts to, you know, think about the city on a macro level rather than a micro level. And um, do you want to say a little bit about how you brought in, you know, this kind of context to your work and what was the intention behind? It? I mean, first of all, actually, when did you, the Palimpsest series, start to emerge from the non-structures work? It, it started to emerge uh, roughly. So I've been working in non-structures for five years and it started to emerge roughly two years ago. Um, and, and I found that... Um, by documenting specific projects, it, it was a very interesting. It was very interesting visually, and also allowed me to to get a case by case understanding of each project. But usually, as well, the relation with these non structures with their surrounding areas that was increasingly I was increasingly interested in that relation because many times the those projects in that were facing a transformation process they were completely disjointed with their surrounding areas, but often as well, buildings that were finalized also felt disjointed from the, from the surrounding areas. So they were 
there was a, 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 an addition of different elements that were not necessarily relating well with each other. Um, and that's when I, I started to think about the series balances and how going to a more, as you were saying, a more macro level and understanding how each one of these elements were relating to each other, but not only now buildings in the middle of a transformation process, but also buildings that were already finalized, but didn't necessarily have or relate well with their surroundings. And, and that image, the, the image before, by the way, uh, everybody would be wondering what, what is that? That is a tower in Caracas, in Venezuela, uh, a tower called Torre David, uh, or David Tower, um, which was never finished. And people started to, a bit like an unstructured that didn't have a function, people gave it a function and squatted and started to live in there, but without any health and safety, all the health and safety regulations that you would have in a finalized building. Uh, Iwan Ban, a Dutch photographer, he did a, an amazing work of documenting what was happening here. And you can see, for example, in this image, how these guys are uh, doing exercise in an area without any, any handrails or any type of security measures. And that would be their architecture or their, their approach to that specific place where they, they were inhabiting. So I, that's, and we had a chat with Luke on how that building that is not finalized, they gave it a use still, and they kind of found a way in which that building could be used. Um, so I, I recommend to look more images, everyone to look uh, for more images of this specific building because it's a really interesting case. And then the series Palins test. Um, this image is in Vauxhall. Uh, in every regeneration project, I would do a little bit of research on the project itself, the positive and the less positive components of the project. This is uh, part of Nine Elms regeneration, uh, a project that in theory in the paper has all the elements to be a really um, kind of good quality regeneration project. Uh, part of it is the renovation of, of a Battersea power station as a linear park that connects Battersea with, with uh, Vauxhall train and bus stations, the architecture quality of the buildings, you can like it more or less, but it's it's all kind of good. I consider it that it's, it's good, generally good quality architecture, but it feels that it's disjointed somehow. And the critics to it has um, have been saying that it's, it's oriented towards an upper section of the market. So even though it delivers 20,000 homes, it would not necessarily be uh, solving any of the problems that the city has right now that London has and the shortage of housing. Um, and as well, it would be very disjointed, not only physically and from an architectural style, but also for the type of users and the type of industries that it, that it, it has. That old area, that, that area was uh, used to, um, used to have a lot of light industrial uses. And all of those uses were wiped out effectively. Only a market, a flower market uh, was moved to one side of the project. Um, and then all of the, the new project is residential towers, office towers, um, which don't necessarily relate well with the rest of the city. And in this image in particular, I tried to, to work with that idea of disconnection and how um, different different generations and different people that have created buildings and designs for that area have approached that area in a different way. So you have first line in front of the river, uh, residential buildings that are probably seven, eight stories high. Then you have to, uh, towards the left hand side, left -hand side of, the, of the image, a uh, building that has probably 40, 50 stories and that uh, it was, uh, oriented towards an upper section of the market. Most of the apartments were bought by ex foreign investors. Uh, and then you have that friction of those two elements and all the elements that are uh, being built in between. Uh, so you have, visually, you have an interesting composition on how that height is going up. But then the image itself, I think it, it begs for a lot of questions about what kind of development is that uh, area going through. Yeah, and I think it's sometimes um, hard for all of that to come across in images, which, you know, particularly now when we're all um, staying at home, 
is the you know the main way that actually the world will see see um these projects and i think it is i think it is actually yeah the nine elms development um you know there's one building where it's got a swimming pool but suspended between two buildings and you know um the images of it look amazing you know i'm sure they get they pay they pay the best architectural photographers to make some sexy pictures of it they get you know beautiful renders which don't always quite correspond with reality mm. um but yeah i think as what you've done in these photographs which are maybe um approach it in a more critical sense than um you know if it's commissioned by the architects and you're doing it in a marketing capacity um but you can start to tell a lot more about the buildings by seeing them from this detached point of view and seeing them in context seeing how they interact with the surroundings and i think then that helps you learn so much more about about the buildings i think that that's that's um you know complements the non-structures series perfectly because together you know they tell two separate stories that help you form this more holistic understanding um so within the images kind of the, the name palimpsest comes from the idea of you know a writing material you write over again again and again and in the same city you know london is kind of famous for you know being a city that's been you know survived the great fire of london and was rebuilt survived uh, the bombing in World War II is rebuilt. There's all these kind of, um, you know, disasters and uprisings again. Um, and what is it that you think drives drives this mentality in cities like London, in cities like New York, that kind of they build up again and again and keep on changing? Um, so I think there are a lot of incentives Obviously, the, the land values are really high in cities like London and New York. There's a lot of incentive towards uh, real estate development. There's a lot of incentive as well because both cities, and particularly London, has a housing shortage. So you need to keep, constantly keep on um, densifying the city and densifying some area of the city, areas of the city to deliver those houses. Uh, and as well, you have some obsolescence of the of uh, buildings and infrastructure. That means that you need to demolish that to, to build new, um, more efficient buildings in a way. Um, but that of, I, I think that obsolescence is actually a key point as many times the physical buildings and infrastructure will have physical obsolescence and financial obsolescence. Uh, and often buildings and cities are going to be changed because they're financially solid in a way. But a lot of the time, the argument used to make those transformations would be that those are physically uh, obsolete, which many times is not the case. So there is a lot of incentive, financial incentive to build in cities like London and, and New York. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think um... Yeah, with these kind of cities, um, you know, something that else that drives drives that kind of constant rebuilding in the city centre is the fact that cities are constrained. So London, um, you know, kind of famously had the original uh, Londinium, the Roman settlement, had the, the wall around it, which kind of remains in some form today. But throughout time, there's always been these um, kind of rules and restrictions um, about, you know, how far out from a city you can build, which is, you know... Um, today realized itself in the green belt which is an area of land around london where um you know it's mostly golf courses villages um farms where you know there's much tighter restrictions on what you can build there and that contains the city um the alternative is um and to illustrate this i've used brilliant um image by hashem shikari of um taken outside of tehran um and the idea of urban sprawl which is that rather than having to constantly reinvent the city centre, you can build outside of the city and expand the city. Um, and I think this is, got, again, coming into focus with the pandemic in a way that, you know, we're not all um, flocking into city centres to work. You know, we can work any, from anywhere in the world via, via the internet. Do you think that maybe um, it will be a trend that cities will kind of start to break out of these constraints? You know, will we have more sprawl, will we have more commuter towns been built? How do you think um, that will apply? Um, it's, it's hard to tell, and I guess everybody is trying to, to guess what's going to happen in the future. 
what what I for what I know on the information uh, the, the the texts and uh, papers that I have read about urban sprawl it, is that it's not the most efficient way of making a city growing and there is a particular um, comparison which is really interesting at Atlanta in the U.S. is ten times uh, or emits 10 times as much carbon as Barcelona in Spain. Uh, even though the two cities are similar in population and income levels. But the fact that Atlanta is much more spread uh, means that because of transport and because of all the infrastructure that you have to build to allow people to reach those destinations that are much further away, uh, that means that you will end up polluting more and having a less efficient city. So even though it's tempting and uh, to, to live in, in the outskirts of the city, probably where you have more access to green areas, um, it's not always the most efficient way of, of uh, living. It's different if you have a, a well-organized system of trains, uh, of public transport, and you, then you can organize that very well. But I think that from an efficiency perspective and from uh, emission of CO2 and contamination, Usually, if you have to rely on the car, you will have a much better way of, or a much more efficient city if it's compact and if it's densified. But again, if you go to the, the other extreme, uh, how dense should you build and how tall, tall should buildings be? Uh, many times in the, in the name of uh, densification or in the name of sustainability, a lot of towers uh, are being built in many areas which are, in my opinion, a little bit too high, maybe. Uh, that bearing in mind that the densest city in Europe is Paris. Uh, and Paris has, has constructions all over the city of six, seven, eight stories. It only has, only has one part of Paris, La Defense, where you have higher buildings. Um, so that I think it's particularly interesting to think how how city how the different sites relate to each other, so we can create more density, but without increasing it to levels that are not efficient. Again, what are, what are your thoughts on that, Luke? Yeah, well, I think maybe um, a model that's I guess more of a reasonable uh, settlement is the idea of a kind of polycentric city. So rather than a city being gravitated towards one center where there's lots of smaller centers and kind of um you know specialist centers for you know particular businesses might be um clustered in one area a particular social scene might be clustered in one area so yeah. that there is kind of more of a balance so that that requires um you know infrastructure to support it and it requires like you said earlier the idea of flexibility and i think um you know it's important that I guess um, maybe something that positive that does come out of density is the idea that you can't just, um, you know, if things go wrong, you can't just build again and keep building more and more. You have to design in the idea that buildings can be maintained. But they, and is that, I guess, Francisco, is that something that you've seen um, through this project that architects have considered that whole life cycle? They have considered that buildings will need to be fixed and made away for that to be done or have you found that it's the opposite and actually they only fix things when they're about to break? I, I, it would be interesting to, to hear some comments if, if we have on the, on the questions, but personally I haven't seen that, that the full life cycle of buildings is planned at the design stage. Uh, I, have, I have worked in projects in Chile and in the UK and generally uh, A lot of a lot of the projects that I have worked in, the the architects and everybody involved in the project, they would be have they would be really interested in make the project sustainable, efficient, not use a lot of resources. But the question on how and when the the building will die, I haven't seen that uh, happening much. And I think it's really important to start questioning that and, and thinking about how how our city is going to be in 50 years time, 60 years time. Many of the projects that are being built today, they're probably not, will not be in great shape in 50, 60 years. Yeah. And I mean, I think a lot of the, um, a lot of what we see around the world is actually where um, architects and developers and so on haven't necessarily considered this is that people start to adapt buildings and, you know, adapt spaces that we live in. And um, 
you know, this is another another reference that we brought up of um Yana Sofia Nola of the idea of um you know, kind of she she does work drawing attention to the improvised shelters that um you know the homeless community, particularly in Francisco, um so, sorry, San Francisco, where she's um spent spent a lot of time, they've kind of started to adapt the urban environment to suit their needs. And it's important that I think um you know, architects and the people that are making buildings in the first place should be considering, but you know, um, they they're not they don't have a crystal ball, and that the ways that people use buildings will change over time, and it's important that they they accommodate that. But also another constraint is the idea of infrastructure in cities. Um, and again, when we were chatting before before we um, went live in this conversation, one idea we we're talking about is how, particularly Western cities in the 20th century were really planned around the car. And you can see that in, you know, parts of London where, you know, for example, South Circular or Euston Road, where it's not really a particularly nice place to be walking through because, you know, traffic dominates. That's the main way that people get around. Um, and how do, I guess, how do architects and approach that idea of the constraints of infrastructure that's been built before? You know, how do, I guess, firstly, planners come up with a way that infrastructure does have that flexibility for changes in the way we think think about our cities but then also how do architects building new buildings um you know work around those constraints it, i think it, it really depends on on the country and the city and the really different regions how the, how they they would approach it um but for me, it's it's particularly interesting how how previous generations there they were trying to incorporate the new technologies, the use of the car, the use of new materials, uh, prefabricated materials, and in and many in many ways we are now trying to make up for them some of the damages of those decisions in the past, uh, and somehow how we face the challenges that we have right now is going to be. Uh, Kind of challenged by future generations in a way. So again, we come to, to the topic of flexibility and how important it is to maybe think that, okay, right now we, we need cars for a project. In the future, we might not have cars. How are we going to use that space and how we're going to reutilize re that particular um, infrastructure that in the future might not be used? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and as well, some, some buildings and some infrastructure that was built in the past what can we do with it without necessarily demolishing it? Understanding that it has a lot of embodied carbon, it has a lot of um, resources that were used there and not it's not the best, the most efficient thing to do to demolish it and start from scratch. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I guess so a lot of the way that we've been, we've been talking about architecture has been kind of on the borderline of politics um, and one, ref one, um, you know, one piece of art I wanted to bring up where it maybe wasn't a direct influence for you at the time you started this project, but I think in retrospect, we can agree is very related to what you're doing and touching a lot of the same themes is um, Rachel White Reed's piece House, which is kind of a cast of, um, you know, a, a Victorian house, which was demolished um, by, by the local government. Um, and it's a piece that I wanted to bring up because it's something which became quite political, um, you know, and it was covered a lot in the tabloids at the time and was seen kind of as a political statement of sorts. And I wanted to ask you, um, do you think your work is political and do you think that photography has a place in political discourse? I think, I think it is political, uh, definitely. And the images themselves are, are quite neutral and they're not necessarily placing, for example, a, a lot of dramatism in a, in a scene which I could give my opinion more as a photographer and saying this is good or this is bad. I actually try the images to be neutral and show what's happening, document what's happening. But at the same time, the pure fact that I have made the photography, it's already a statement saying this is important and we should have an uh, we should have more attention on these kind of things. Um, and the transformation of the built environment is political. There are a lot of, it's influenced by political decisions. Every, every um, 
project will have a context, a political context, an economic context within uh, which it's going to sit. Um, and a lot of the decisions that are going to be taken are leaded by that context. So without, without giving a clear statement in my work about a political position maybe, I think it's definitely political. And I think I'm hoping that it can create some, some political discussions as well as discussions in other, in other areas as well. Yeah, I think um, so some, on that theme, so I think this sticks with me really is um, Ed Batinsky, he's one of my, my favorite photographers. He does a lot of work about the Anthropocene, which is the idea of how humans have influenced the landscape and he photographs industrial structures and in infrastructure a lot. And I went to a, a talk um, he did a couple of years ago and someone asked him, you know, is by photographing things like oil rigs, is he endorsing um, kind of the industrial economic complex or whatever? Um, and he was saying that kind of his job as a photographer is not to tell people what to think, but to show them and to show them how things are and they can make their mind. And I think we've seen, you know, particularly in the last few years in politics, people really don't like, <clears throat> excuse me, being told what to think. Um, but maybe the place of art is to show people and kind of suggest things and show them, you know, let them make their own mind up. So I think that's far more powerful than it is just to instruct them what to think. I think, um, yes, yeah, kind of relates a little bit to um, one of the questions we've had from Fernand. So please do keep those questions coming in, by the way, whether it's on Zoom, on YouTube, and we'll be feeding a few more of them in in a few minutes. Um, but do you think that the work that you're doing documenting buildings, that's something that can feed into the zeitgeist and you know, this documentation and critical reflection of buildings is something that has the power to change how architects approach making buildings. And you think that's something you've seen happen and will happen more in the future? Or do you think things, will, the status quo will continue and things are business as usual? Um, I would like to think that it will have some, some power to challenge uh, this status quo. Um, and at the same time, I, I think that as I mentioned at the beginning of, the, of, the, of our discussion, architecture, urbanism, they're not exact sciences. And that means that there is no perfect project and all the projects that we build can be critically analyzed and we can challenge them to be better. And there are several things that can be improved. Um, so I think that the discussion actually needs, needs uh, I would like to think that my work fits into the discussion. And as well, we need some other critical pieces to feed into the discussion as well on how we can improve what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also it's, um, something else I wanted to bring up is it's not just about photographers and about academics and about architects feeding into this discussion. It's about, um, you know, anyone. I think social media is something that's particularly enabled that. Um, but I think it's really important that, um, you know, communities themselves have agency in how um, you know developments go about within within their area, and that this is you know it's important that I guess the discourse is fed into from multiple points of view. There is a, this image relates to a question from Paul. Uh, he asks about the technical process and do you do you still shift lenses and where are the people removed or did you have to wait them for them to pass? Um, and did I wait? Did I choose the photograph on overcast days, uh, or did I weather, or did the weather dictate that? So, by part, the um, uh, I do use a till shift. Uh, I do use till shift lenses, uh, tripod. That's a common. That's a common equipment for an architectural photographer. Um, although the tripod is a reminder, um, re remains from the time where you had to work with analog cameras and that dictated that you needed to use very slow speeds. Today, technology is improving and you can have use higher, higher ISOs. The lenses are brighter as well. So in many cases, you don't necessarily need a tripod. You can photograph without a tripod. Uh, but tilt shift lenses, for those of, uh, for the viewers who don't know what they are, it's a lens that you can move the front part and do perspective correction in camera. Uh, those are very important for architectural photographers. Either you use or you don't use a tripod. Um, the approach to having people in the photos, uh, I, 
I have, when I started the series, I did modify digitally some uh, images to remove people from the photos. But from uh, probably four years ago, I have put myself a strict rule of, of not modifying the photos digitally. So waiting for not having people on the photos for the series non structures or waiting for to have some scenes that I'm interested in the series palimpsest. And if, if I can't photograph in the, in the case of the series non structures, if I can't photograph the, the photos or, or if I can't find a moment without people, then the photo will remain with the people because I'm documenting something that it's happening. Um, and the weather, it did dictate it. The, the light at the beginning a little bit <laughs> uh, because obviously the weather here in the UK it's uh, it tends to be overcast and cloudy um, but as well it has it has uh, it is a decision as well in the sense that as the Beckers and as the other photographers from the Dusseldorf School of Photography um, using that those overcast skies means that you will not have shadows you will not have you will uh, remove a lot of dramatism from the image, you would make a more neutral image and you can start making or collecting these images in typologies and putting them side by side, removing a little bit the reference to, to time. Um, and this photo of like Claudio Rego, Claudio Rego is a politician from Chile, he's not a photographer. And I have to say, and I'm actually not 100% sure that he took this photo, but he, is, he made this photo famous and it was definitely taken with a cell phone. Um, and this image sparked a lot of uh, discussion around um, buildings that were built in certain areas of Santiago or certain boroughs that didn't have uh, an approved uh, planning document or any planning regulation effectively. So developers were building these very, very tall buildings uh, where a lot of apartments were fit into the building and they were started to being called vertical ghettos and this image sparked a lot of discussion about these vertical ghettos and how we should make cities evolve and how we should build in Santiago. Um, so I would say that a good camera, a good lens, a good equipment helps a lot to create a good image, but we're still, uh, it's still true, I think, that a good idea, um, a powerful idea, a good composition, uh, a good image in general, can be made with different camera, digital cameras of different range, with cell phones, with analog cameras. Uh, so the most important thing is still the idea behind the photo. Yeah. So I'm I'm aware uh, I'm aware now. We've been talking for a very long time. I've sort of uh, you know been engrossed in 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 your work and your you know your comments, Francisco, and kind of let it run away a little bit. So last opportunity to bring in some questions. Um, to those, to those of you who are on Zoom or on YouTube. Um, I wanted to ask, um, again, another, another practical question from um, Amanzul, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, he says, just from, or they say, um, just from a practical standpoint, how do you find the sites for your images? Uh, is there kind of a process to it or is it just, um, you know, random and opportunistic? Um, that is a really good question. I have, um, it's a combination of both. So it involves, my photography work involves a lot of hours scouting the city, cycling around, looking for the places uh, that I'm interested in photographing and finding interesting particular construction sites or um, certain areas of the cities which are interesting for my work. And it has a lot of uh, reading about different projects and I would find a lot of them by people that tells me about uh, those specific projects. So for example, that photo of the church, Luke, can we go back to it? Yeah, yeah, of course. It, it was actually you that told me about it. Yeah, I, we, we had to sneak in because I know there's so many times, I guess you probably get this from a few other people as well, where I'm out about in London, I'll text you, oh, Francisco, have you seen this, you know, the scaffold up? And you was like, oh yeah, yeah, I shot that three months ago. <laughs> but now I, I found one you hadn't seen finally. So I'm glad, glad, glad that works out. Um, anyway, yeah, and another another question we have um, from Mariana is, um, how can you 
really incorporate the concept of a death into a building in its construction. So is it possible at all for a designer to forecast how a building will die and to account for that? Um, I think it's, it's a matter of, of uh, you, will, you will never know what's going to happen with, with uh, a building, but we roughly know as human beings, for example, that we're going to die at a certain age. Um, and in buildings, it's roughly the same. We should know how long they would last. I mean, we architects, designers, they do have a general idea of how long they would last, but not necessarily plan for how they will die, how they will be demolished, how they will be refurbished in the future. There are some very good examples of architecture around the world where they have done that and it's, and it's brilliant. Um, there are some good examples as well where some projects have been designed to be flexible and, and when the time comes where you have to transform it, 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 they used a certain technology or a certain approach to construction that didn't allow the project to be flexible. So there are many examples around the world, but I think we could do much more for, for planning for the death of buildings and planning how, how they will be transformed in the future. How can they accommodate different uses? Um, as we're seeing now, as we mentioned before, offices being converted to, res to, to apartments. That will happen in Santiago, for example, uh, pretty soon in Santiago, there is a huge office stock and the um, rate of sales has gone down by a lot in the last year because of the pandemic. So we will have a lot of space that needs to be reused. And those buildings were not necessarily designed thinking that they could be used as, ap as apartments. And that's something that we need to incorporate. Okay, so just finally, Francisco, because I think, uh, yeah, we have been droning on for a while. So yeah, thank you to the audience for staying with us for so long and for engaging and asking questions. Um, but just to kind of to round things off, do you want to tell us a little bit about how this project's going to grow and um, what's coming up next for you? Um, yes, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of our uh, conversation, I'm moving now back to Chile, to Santiago, which is something that I'm really excited about. Um, being out of the, of the city of Santiago, which is the city where I grew up, um, I think I'm going to be able to see it with fresh eyes, with new eyes, and that's something that I'm really excited about, to start photographing, documenting the city, working with some of the same methodologies that I started to work here in London, but in Santiago. I want to continue those series, conducting a lot of research work, um, photographic research work in Santiago, and as well, I'm starting my uh, own practice with a colleague uh, called named Sebastian Arauz. He's an architect as well. And we're going to be incorporating a lot of the discussion and the topics that we're exploring, that I'm exploring in my photo series in our work as architects and urban planners. So that's going to be interesting to bring theory into practice. That, it, that will be something that I'm, it will be challenging for sure. Uh, but it will be very interesting. Um, and I want to continue working and developing this, the series that I have been developing in London continue to document the, the growth and the transformation of London, uh, which is a city that I already know very well and I want to keep on working with it. What about you, Luke? What are your future plans? Yeah, well, um, I can't have a chat without, with you without um, doing a shameless plug for our exhibition that we've been working on. So this was meant to happen last year. Um, who knows when it's going to happen now, but hopefully sometime this year. We've started um, curating an exhibition together called Power Structures, which touches on some of the same themes um, you know, throughout your projects and stuff I'm doing as well about how, um, you know, political powers and economic powers can shape the built environment and places we live in. So that's one to, that's one to watch out for. And I'll leave um, both of our details on screen. So in case anyone is interested in having a look at some of the other stuff that we do and um, getting in touch or anything. Um, I'll say as well, the video at the start, if you want to watch it again or want to share it with um, friends, family, colleagues, whoever, I think we'll leave a link for that in the YouTube description and we'll hopefully pop it in the Zoom chat as well um, to make sure that's available. So yeah, um, anyone looking to commission a building, of course, look to Francisco and his new practice. Uh, he sells lovely prints as well, if you didn't notice from our picture of his exhibition. Um, but yeah, thank you so much everyone for sticking with us for so long and watching. Thank you again to the Anglo-Chilean Society for hosting us and yeah, I'll hand back to Alistair to sign off.
Thank you uh, very much, uh, <clears throat> Luke and Francisco. Uh, that was a really fantastic insight um, into development of London, a city that uh, I was brought up in. So it was fascinating to see uh, places that I'm so familiar with. And it is extraordinary, uh, the reconstruction and redevelopment in that city. And I hope, uh, Francisco, you'll be able to go back to Santiago. And I can see there's definitely scope for some work in Santiago um, for some, some uh, planning and architecture over there. Um, in fact, I noticed that on the call, I don't know whether he's still on it, was Professor Enchenike of Urban Planning, planning at uh, Cambridge University, who's been advising the government in Santiago. So uh, maybe the two of you um, should chat sometime. Um, anyway, uh, it's been a real uh, honor to have you uh, with us this evening. And um, it's great for the society to be able to support uh, people like you um, <clears throat> who are doing uh, such great works. And um, thank you very much for your time. And thank you to all of those who have been uh, following this uh, event this evening. I very much look forward to seeing you uh, in the next uh, couple of months uh, when we'll have uh, several more events, which are all on our website. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Luke and Francisco. And I think that's a uh, good evening from us. Thank you, Alizé. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.